I would invite you to turn to the book of Colossians and chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Now, little by little, I've actually been working my way through the book of Colossians. And by little by little, I mean, I had a, a message out of the first 12 verses, what was it, a, two or three months ago? And then last week, we went through the next several verses. Today, we'll be looking at verses 21 to through 23. And uh, it, as the Lord directs, you know, as there's opportunity to preach again, we may continue there. I will tell you in advance, I won't be doing the rest of the chapter. That's just a personal decision. But that is because when we started our 9.30 a.m. discipleship time, uh, just as instructional and uh, foundational, Pastor Laramie actually did a session on those exact verses. And so that's been quite recently as well. Uh, and, and so that's my rationale for that. Not that you even cared, right? But uh, we're glad to have you here today. Thankful for the scripture reading we had out of 2 Corinthians 5. Let me read the verses as we begin, and then we'll jump right in. Verses 21, 22, and 23 out of Colossians 1. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, uh, he, that is Christ, has now reconciled in the body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So the idea is reconciliation. Reconciliation. We see the word reconciled listed in verse 21. It also was referenced in verse 20 the, that we looked at last week, through him to reconcile to himself all things and so forth. Uh, so reconciliation can bring a lot of things to mind. One of the things that it brings to me is a, a point in, in American history that's quite interesting. It may not be crucial. In fact, it isn't crucial to the history of America itself. But in 1878, there was a dis disputed ownership of a pig, which may have, key word, I'm being fair, may have launched the infamous Hatfield-McCoy feud near the West Virginia-Kentucky border. Um, there are plenty of other theories. One of, the, one of the significant theory is the fact that the Hatfields and the McCoys just 10 years previous or 15 years previous during the Civil War had members that fought on opposite sides of the Civil War. And so now, whatever the reason, there was some significant animosity between the Hatfields and the McCoys. As a result, through the years, through the decades, there were people who were murdered because of this. There were plenty of arrests that were made. There were even some convictions that stood up and a few of either the Hatfields or the McCoys that spent time in prison as a result. And on and on and on it went. It became so famous or infamous that when you thought of an ongoing feud without resolution, uh, it was commonplace to think of the Hatfields and the McCoys. Now, I raise all this here because I didn't spend any time in the western part of the United States growing up. I only know that it was commonplace in language where I grew up in the Midwest, which wasn't close to them. So I don't know if their story was commonly told out here or not. But I tell you, it was a vicious thing. Now, interestingly enough, in 1979, so about 100 years after the pig-stealing incident, in 1979, there were descendants of the two families, the Hatfields and the McCoys, that appeared for an entire week on the TV show Family Feud. I, if you've seen the show, I guess that's a point of some resolution. I suppose if they're at that point, 100 years later, at least able to be in the same room, I have no idea how it went. I didn't research who won or how that turned out. 
Um, I I did see one writer that said that he thought that probably at the end of the week, they probably had to make sure each family had the exact same dollar total to make sure there weren't other reasons for ongoing feuding. But nonetheless, I ask you, is that what we think of when we think of reconciliation? Ah, We can get into a TV show studio for whatever length of time that takes. Well, what do you think of when it comes to reconciling in general? Perhaps you think of maybe family or uh, friends who are coming back together after being at odds. Maybe you're thinking of an accounting process because there is that accounting process called reconciling or reconciliation that has nothing to do with relationships except between numbers and columns and totals and sums. Perhaps you think of settling an argument during a committee discussion. I have put discussion in, in quotation marks there. If you've ever been with a company and you gather together and you're around to see what kind of discussion goes on for coming to a resolution or a conclusion or direction, it's not always the nicest of things. Uh, what about uh, the possibility of coming to grips without you know, with some situation that you find it very difficult to accept. Sometimes you use this expression, I'm just trying to reconcile this in my mind, right? That's not you and another person. That's you with this event that took place that seems evil or ominous or whatever, and it's just difficult to accept that it even took place in the first place. Well, today we're going to be talking about one specific reference to reconciliation, and that is the reconciling of man to God, of sinful man in his animosity to a holy and righteous God. How does that happen? And how does it happen? And in fact, we're here today because it has happened. Salvation is perhaps the most general word used for that experience, that change in our relationship to where we, by faith, trust the Lord Jesus Christ's gift that he gave on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and have then trusted him and come into that family so that we have God as Heavenly Father. We have eternal life. We have all of that. But there are many specific terms for that. Uh, And so we're not looking at all of them today. We're really just focusing on reconciliation. There is salvation. It might be thought of as most general, but I guess specifically that would be the reference that refers to our being delivered from danger. That is a reference to God taking away that judgment that he has righteously held out for all those who are in sin. There is justification We mentioned that briefly in our discipleship time this morning. Justification is a judicial reference. We are forgiven. And not just are we forgiven, oh yeah, I know what you did, but go ahead. It's No, rather, we are looked upon as being without that guilt because Jesus Christ took that payment, that penalty upon himself on the cross. There is redemption which focuses on our being purchased out of bondage. We indeed, without Christ, apart from Christ, are in bondage uh, indeed. And thankful we are that the Lord has bought us in that way. It's a focus on the price that was paid and the freedom that was granted. Adoption is another word for salvation, one that focuses on the relational change into the family of God. God becomes our heavenly father. Sanctification is another term uh, whereby we focus on the change of character, whereby God, through Jesus Christ, eliminates sin. Have we made it there? No, no, we're, we're not there. We haven't reached that. And we will one day, 1 John 3, 2, when we see him, when we see the Lord, we shall be like him. Until then, we struggle, but we thank the Lord for sanctification and the focus of salvation that is on the change of character. But today, we look only at reconciliation, only at reconciliation. 
end today, here's, here's my head start, my telling you in advance what I'm going to tell you. And that is we're going to talk about the object of reconciliation. That is man who is sinful, who needs this reconciliation. We're secondly going to look at the means of reconciliation. The means of reconciliation, which is the perfect life and sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. We'll then look at the purpose of reconciliation, which is to bring a sinful mankind to a holy and righteous God. And finally, we'll look at the method of reconciliation, which is through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. For unworthy sinners have no other hope. So we'll look at those items today, all out of these verses, and we'll certainly look at other scripture along the way. But we find this all here in verses 21 through 23. The object, the means, the purpose, and the method of reconciliation. So let's look first of all at the object of, revel, of, of reconciliation. <clears throat> and without this, there's no reason to go on. Let me read verse 21. The Bible says, and you, and since I'm the one doing the speaking, I'll also say me, who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. This is a picture of the object, the target of this reconciliation. It's not a very pretty picture, is it? He says, and we'll divide it into two parts. They're really indivisible. They're one and the same, but they have slightly different reference here. But first, he indicates that they were once alienated. They were once alienated. Do you know you and I were alienated from God? Do you know what, do you know what it's like to be lost? Uh, I, a few times in my life, I have been lost, but the trouble that I, uh, that I consider in my mind is being lost from another person that we seek. Uh, so I've, I've taken lots of long walks through the years and taken wrong turns, and my three-mile walk turned into an eight-mile walk, things like that. I, I've been lost. I've, I admit that. I can remember my kids still remind me of my taking them on a walk in central Pennsylvania once, and they still didn't understand how we could, the walk could be uphill both ways. And uh, it just seemed like them, what, what they were forgetting was like about a 50 foot steep descent in the middle. So it was uphill, steep, and then uphill back. But that was a case where I didn't really know where I was, but had a sense of where I was going. That's one thing. I can remember my brother and I as, as younger children, we did not enjoy those times when my mom said it's time to go to Galesburg to go shopping and uh, the groceries that was fine because it was you know we knew what we were doing and it was targeted and you had a list and when you got the list done you were done but when she was clothes shopping it was just as a young boy it wasn't the most exciting we we'd be running around we were ornery We'd go like in, you know, those circle racks that were full of clothes. We'd be go running around and get inside of those to see if we could hide ourselves from mom. Uh, we never did get to a point where she had the announcement over the speaker. Well, you please come to the service desk. But uh, there were several times when she probably had to walk around and look under the clothes to see which had legs to find us. Being lost when you're really lost and panicky that's what this alienated is. That's what this alienated is all about. Notice, I asked the question, how did this happen? When did it happen? Where did it happen? The answer is the same in all three respects, right? And that is the Garden of Eden. When mankind was put in a perfect environment with singularly clear instruction, and yet disobeyed God and fell into sin. This is when it happened. It was a willful disobedience. Eve may have taken by deception, but Adam willfully took and plunged mankind into sin. Genesis 3.8, this removes all doubt. They knew it instantly. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife 
hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They didn't have to be told that they had been alienated from God. They knew it. They understood it. Now, this word alienated, the specific word that is used here in the Greek, only appears three times in the whole New Testament. But to get an idea of what this is and the hopelessness of it is, let me read the other two verses. In Ephesians 2.12, we are spoken of as being apart from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And then in Ephesians 4.18, speaks of man and his sin being darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. And so I ask the question, is it a good place to be, to be alienated, separated from God? Alienated doesn't sound so great, but think about being excluded. We are excluded from the Lord and without God in this world, that we are separated from the life of God. This is an alienation that is serious. And I will tell you that every one of us, every man, woman, and child that has been in this earth has sinned, has, was born with sin, and has chosen sin, and has been alienated from the Creator who created them and loved them and gave His Son for them. But it doesn't stop there. That would be bad enough. But it goes on to say, in verse 21, not only once alienated, but he also refers to them as hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. This puts it back, if there's any question at all about whether we have a part in this, you know, is, is it easy for us sometimes in a comical sense to just blame Adam or blame Eve or whatever? It's not my fault. Oh, it's my fault. I have sinned. I I'm hostile in mind and I have done evil deeds. This is a deliberateness of making ourselves an enemy to God. We cannot claim innocence just because I wasn't the one in the garden at that time. Adam was perfect man in a perfect environment with perfectly clear instructions and fell and plunged all of us into sin. None of us can claim innocence. Back to the passage Scott read for us earlier today, 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. This is an important reference because so many times we look at the word of God and the message of God according to the flesh, according to man's approach, man's logic. How does that fit in with whether we're guilty or innocent? Well, I ask isn't it true that we enjoy considering ourselves as innocent? You can come up with your own examples in your mind. I, let me just mention generalities. At our work, perhaps. I don't know what your work is or has been. Did you ever have a point at which you had to sit down for a formal job review and hear what they said about your, you and your performance and your approach positively and negatively? Was it easy to just kind of peek up and cast the blame? So, well, I'm not responsible for what you're saying. That, ah, it's so-and-so. And is it easy for us to claim innocence? What about the office pettiness that we sometimes experience? What, ta- what about occasions when a company fails to, to reach their goals and then we're quick to say, well, it's not my fault. You know, here's what I did. I did my job. Now, In any of those cases, the claim can absolutely be legitimate. But I'm just saying that it is really easy for us to instantly go and put ourselves in the place of innocence. What about in our relationships? I have have some childhood friends that I haven't spoken with for years. We didn't end on with animosity. We just went our separate ways and, and haven't seen or heard from them in years or decades there's no anger there's no disputes going on or anything like that but sometimes there are those 
those friendships that break up with animosity. And how, who's going to be the first one? So, no, I'm innocent, he's not. You get into the Hatfield-McCoy thing. What about parents and children who maybe don't really talk? You know, and, and you do what you can. But my point is, in all of this, that we easily can assume, without even considering, our own innocence. What if you just receive criticism? You receive criticism from a neighbor who says, hey, you need to do this and that, such and such, or friends and family. I go all the way back to high school grading. You know, if, if it was a vocabulary test, a spelling test, a math test, you know, the answer is going to be right or wrong. It was really easy to tell. Uh, but if it was an essay, didn't you like to look at those red marks and dispute them in your mind? Think, oh, no, 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 this should be higher. This should be okay. We always found a way to present ourselves positively. And mankind likes to look at, his, at himself positively. It's important. I'm not talking about all those other things now. I'm talking about us before God. And so the question is this. Do we try to make ourselves innocent before God or do we understand and accept that we have and continue to do wrong? Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way. We talked about sheep in the discipleship time this morning as well, but uh, we are like those sheep. We've gone our own way. We've done what we want to do. So verse 21 makes it very plain that the object, which really becomes the whole reason that reconciliation is necessary, the object of this reconciliation is mankind who is hostile to God and alienated from God. So let's continue. Verse 22, the Bible says, He has now reconciled in the body of his flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him and so jesus here shows us the means of reconciliation which is through the perfect life and sacrificial death of jesus christ he makes it very plain uh, reconciled in the body of his flesh by his death in order to accomplish this now he did die but we need to start before that we need to understand that it needed to be that sinless, perfect Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice. Anything short of that and the death of Jesus would have been for his own sin. But in this case, he first lived that perfect life. Romans 5.17 says, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. A couple things to go back to there. By one man's trespass, that's Adam. For in Adam all sin. For in Adam all die. Through that one man, death reigned. Much more... There is an opportunity for this righteousness of life that only the Lord can provide, but it is through that one man, Jesus Christ. Romans 5.19, just two verses later, says, For as by the one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many were made sinners, that's you, that's me. So by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. Jesus Christ lived his life in righteousness, without sin, without slip up, without error, without mistake. I thought this week of an incident that goes back, I think first grade, could have been second grade. Honestly, my memories back that, way, that far get a little fuzzy and kind of overlapped. But I remember sitting in a classroom and coming in after recess and looking up earlier in the, in the same day, we had all done a, some, some kind of a art project in our, at our desk. And they were all hanging up along the board. And one of them 
was scribbled on a big black marker, not marker, crayon. I don't think markers had been invented when I was that age. And uh, so it, that crayon just marked it all up. It was horrible. It was the artwork of one of the girls in the class, happened to be a girl that a lot of kids picked on a lot. To this day, I have no idea what happened, who did that, whatever. But the method of discovery for the teacher was first to ask, then to insist, and when none of that worked, to start with one row and say, okay, you are all getting punished for this until somebody fesses up. So the first person to go out, and by punishment, they meant you had to stand out in the hall against the wall for like five minutes. That was their punishment. And so the first person went out, in a sense, just being shamed. Um, They went out as guilty, whether or not they were. Uh, But that person happened to be, to a little first or second grader like myself, somebody who I considered a friend. I didn't think he did it. I still have no idea if he did it. But I didn't want him to have to suffer. And at that point, I shot my hand up and he said, I did it, I did it. I did not do that. But I went outside, listened to the teacher lecture me for a while and stood there and suffered that. And I have no idea what story they might have sent home to my parents. I have selectively blocked out that part of my memory. I only know that I believed him to be innocent. I did not want him to suffer, and so I went in his place. Now, I was not a theologian. I wasn't even saved. I had not trusted the Lord as Savior. I just had a connection with this other kid, and I did what I probably should not have done. Now, please forgive me. It doesn't matter what illustration you claim for the reconciliation of sinful man to a holy God, it will pale. And so I know this one looks absolutely foolish. But it's what came to mind as I thought of this. We were looking for an innocency of life. And I can tell you, I was innocent of that act. I did not do it. I don't know why anybody would. And yet I put myself in that position. Jesus Christ, who's the Son of God, the Holy One, came to take human form. He lived a life of perfect obedience. That's Jesus' side. Our side, we're sinners. We're born in sin. We're sinners by choice. And even if we wanted to try, we cannot live a life of perfection. Jesus' death, therefore, is marvelous, but it would have been worthless without his sinless life as a foundation for that sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 11, and 12 say this. Every priest stands daily at his service or sacrifice, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The only reason the death of Jesus Christ was effective for forgiving sins for taking the judgment of that sin, was that he lived that sinless and perfect life. And I can tell you, the devil did everything in his power to try to plunge Jesus into some form of sin before getting to that cross. It did not just begin in the wilderness, but it continued then throughout his life as there were temptation after temptation And yet the Lord, by his sinless life, could then accomplish reconciliation through his death. Uh, Verse 21, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. 2 Corinthians 5.14, passage read earlier in our service. One has died for all. Verse 15, he died for all. It was him who who for their sake died. And then in verse 21, after three plain references to the death of Christ, he explains that. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus Christ, the sinless man and son of God, went to the cross. And he went there because of me. He went there because of you. 
And I'm so thankful for that death that made that possible, the reconciliation that we can enjoy. On that cross, then, our sin can be imputed to him. He can receive on his account the judgment for all the sins that we have committed. It was imputed to him as Jesus took the sin of the world, but no sin of his own. He took our sin that we might be able to have his righteousness. In Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, or about nine o'clock to noon. And about, or about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's a hymn that we sing here occasionally that has this strange line in it, speaking of the Lord on the cross, referring to that as God estranged from God. I can't figure that out. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, hung on the cross and bore the weight of the sin of the world and was separated from God to a point that for three hours the sun did not shine. There was darkness on the face of the earth. And Jesus understood that his Father, the, that God himself rather, had forsaken him at that time. And so we have the means but let's look at the purpose. The purpose. In verse 22, continuing the rest of that verse, the Bible says, in order that. That's a good place, good set of words to use to find the purpose. In, in, order, that, uh, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. The purpose of reconciliation is to present man to God. To present man to God. It's a wonderful occurrence. Sinful man, you and I, cannot approach God on our own. We do not have the ability. And yet, we need look no further than the Old Testament to find many examples of individuals who have illegitimate and some legitimate efforts to come to God. Some of them don't even recognize the true God, but they're still trying to come to God in some respect. Consider the world around us with the primitive and, and even modern sophisticated religions with a purpose of bringing God to man, however, or man to God, however they define God. In the Old Testament, we read of Baal worship and other Canaanite religions. We read of the Babylonian and the Akkadian and all the other religions that are out there and the horrors that were involved. But they existed and some perverted way of trying to make man right before God to receive the blessings of good crops and rain and a victory in battle and all of these other things. Even in the book of Judges, we read about a family in the northern area of the land who found a priest who was traveling and essentially tried to hire their own religion. Let's hire our own local sacrifice so that we don't have to go about this God's way. They were still looking for their own way to serve their own needs. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve hid themselves because of their sin. In, he, in Hebrews 8.3, we read that every high priest, for everyone it is necessary to have something to offer. They could not come before the Lord's presence without sacrifice. And we understand in Revelation 21, 27, that nothing in unclean will ever enter it. That is the eternal presence of, of the Lord. Not anyone who does that which is detestable or false, but only those that are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is where we find ourselves wanting God's blessing, but no way to get there on our own. We are apart from God. And so the purpose of reconciliation is to find a way to bring man to God and to bring him as a perfect man. Because after all, we're bringing 
above reproach, holy and blameless and above reproach, the verse says, before God. Needless to say, this is a point. Like I, I'm, I was saved when I was 10 years old. I had not committed bank robberies, killed anyone. I, I hadn't committed many of the heinous crimes if modern people would put them in their own order. But I was a sinner and I was apart from the Lord. And it was, I had gone to church for years. I had said prayers in my home for years. But I was without the Lord because I had not yet come to him and trusted him as savior and just told him lord i'm a sinner i acknowledge that i deserve your judgment but lord i want you to save me i accept the gift of jesus christ and what you did for me and that's where we find ourselves that's where we absolutely find ourselves in this day and that brings us to the end what is the method of reconciliation verse 23 says, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Uh, there it is. It's faith. It's the hope of the gospel. Now you might say, well, it's if you stick with it, if you stay with it. Well, yes, that is true. Uh, but again, pardon, I love my grammar. But here in the grammar, this construction is an assumed case. That is, you could almost translate that as since you will. Those who have trusted the Lord as Savior are kept by His power. But there are many who unfortunately have gone to church, said prayers, recited verses, whatever, that have not yet had that moment in time where they trusted the Lord as Savior. And so the Bible is clean, clear. It is through faith. It's not of our works. It's through faith. There is hope, and there is no hope if it is us. It is the gospel, the good news that Jesus makes possible. But interestingly enough, the rest of the verse goes on to say uh, that you heard, which has been proclaimed, in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. The hope of reconciliation, the means of that, or the method of it here is through, uh, by faith, trusting what Jesus has done. But that message is not to be hoarded. We need to share that message. And so the hope of reconciliation, according to this verse, verse is preached to all. It, it doesn't stop here with dealing with it on a personal nature. By the way, how is God's message, in a general sense, preached? I, I can find three broad categories. You might find some more. They might fit under one of the other three. But uh, certainly, I think, of, I think of nature. We read Psalm 8 and other Psalms. We read Re uh, Romans 1, and we recognize that nature is designed to point people to God. I think of Israel. In Isaiah 43, speaking of Israel, God says that you are my witnesses, and this is to the world. I, in Psalm 67 too, God blessed Israel for this purpose, that your way or God's way may be known on earth, your saving power among the nations. And then I think of the Great Commission. I think of the Great Commission to all nations, to all the world. You and I are his witnesses. Now, you might say, well, you forgot the Word of God. Well, I, I understand, but I think that fits with all three of the categories. We see nature, we see Israel, we see believers in the Great Commission. We see all of that in and through the Word of God. And so there is this message to be shared. At the end of verse 23, he says, of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is where the Great Commission comes into play. This is why in our passage out of 2 Corinthians 5, Scott read earlier, we, we began in verse 11 where the Bible says, Paul speaking, we persuade others. In verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. And so it comes to the conclusion. What about us? By birth, we're sinners, we're alienated from God, we're hostile against him. Is there any hope? Yes, 
and that hope through the reconciliation that God has made possible through the life and death of Jesus Christ that we may procure by faith in what he has done and we may trust in what he has done and continues to do in our life. You and I can go boldly now before the throne of grace to God himself if we go because of reconciliation through the person and work of Jesus Christ. God and man, it's more hopeless than any human enmity that you can consider. You draw a line down the aisle of the Senate based on political party, that has nothing in comparison with the hostility of man and God. And yet, there is a way. There is a way. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. Let's bow in a word of prayer as we close. Our Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us as we approach this subject. Lord, we've trusted you as Savior. Lord, this is a time for great humility and great praise and great worship for all that you have done. Uh, Lord, if we've reviewed and we haven't, then this is a time to trust you, to declare ourselves as sinners, admit that, and to, and to claim salvation on the basis of Jesus Christ and what he has done. Lord, help us to bear that message in action in testimony to God and his goodness and his work and in straight testimony of that opportunity of salvation as the Lord gives that opportunity. Lord, I thank you for this. We're separated and without hope, but in Christ, we have that hope and we thank you for that. We praise you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.